Good afternoon. My name is Quiva Dabara, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the fourth lecture of the 2022 Development Matters series, which is supported by Irish Aid. We're delighted to be joined today by Dr. Maria Neira, Director of the Department of Environment, Climate Change and Health at the World Health Organization. She's been generous enough to take time out of her schedule to speak to us. Dr. Neira will speak for about 20 minutes and then we will go to questions and answers with you, our audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. And please feel free to send in any questions you have throughout the session as they occur to you. And we'll come to them as soon as Dr. Neira has finished her presentation. And just a reminder that today's presentation and the Q&A are both on the record. Please feel free also to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And we're also live streaming this afternoon, so you are very welcome if you're watching on YouTube. So I, it is now my pleasure and privilege to introduce Dr. Maria Neira, who is the Director of the Department of Environment, Climate Change and Health at the WHO based in Geneva. Dr. Neira is a medical doctor by training, and she specialized in endocrinology and metabolic diseases at university in Paris. Amongst many distinctions, she's been awarded the Médaille de l'Ordre National du Mérite by the Government of France, and she also received an Extraordinary Woman Award by Her Majesty Queen Letizia of Spain. And in 2019, she was nominated among the top 100 policy influencers in health and climate change. So we are deeply privileged to have you with us today, Dr. Neda. But before we hear from Dr. Neda, I'd like to hand the floor to His Excellency Michael Gaffey, Director General of Irish Aid, to deliver some opening remarks. Thank you very much, Quiva, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, it is a real pleasure for me to open this uh, latest uh, session of the IIEA Development Matters series, which is, as Quiva said, supported by Irish Aid. And it's particularly, uh, I'm particularly pleased to be doing this as one of the first public events that I have uh, taken on since taking on this role of Director General of Irish Aid about just five weeks ago. Uh, now, it has been a very busy five weeks, and I just want to say that last week was, uh, was the budget in Ireland, and I'm very pleased that as part of the budget we received, there has been a 17% increase in the International Development Programme, the ODA of Ireland for 2023. So this helps us address the growing and significant and interlocking uh, problems that we need to face as a development programme. And that's relevant very much to what we're here to discuss today, which is future proofing of the climate health nexus. This is unquestionably an issue of growing global importance and urgency. I think the links between health and climate change should be very obvious, but sometimes really do need to, to be reasserted. Climate change and environmental degradation threaten our ability to maintain good health. It's a very obvious, clear, simple statement, but one that does need to be to be to be underlined. And I think we're there. Therefore, really honoured to have someone as distinguished as Dr. Maria Nera with us uh, here today to address that. It is clear that we need strong global health architecture and that it is be equipped to deal with the effects of climate change. And the pillars of this architecture are multilateral health institutions with the WHO at its heart. And Ireland continues to be a strong supporter of the organization. I spent the last five years as our ambassador in Geneva. So I am very well aware of the importance of the WHO, but also not just, not just in, the, in the, the traditional standard health areas, but right across the areas which need to be addressed in order to achieve the sustainable development goals. Uh, we are very encouraged by the growing body of work that the that WHO is doing on the links between climate health, climate and health systems. And at COP26 last year, Ireland was proud to join the WHO-led Alliance for Transformative Action on Climate and Health, which aims to build climate resilient and sustainable health systems. Uh, and I was very happy to learn that our own national health service, the Health Service executive is currently working on its own climate strategy for our health systems. At the international level, 
Ireland is very active across the area of health and climate action, both in our diplomacy and through our international development programming. And we have committed to over 100 million per year to global health since 2020, focusing on equitable health system strengthening in low income contexts. It's just the week before last that I was with Minister Coveney uh, in New York, and he announced Ireland's new pledge to the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria of 65 million for the next three years, an increase of 30% on our last pledge. This reflects our deep awareness of the, of the importance of adopting a one health approach, which highlights the centrality of climate proofing for preventing future pandemics. The impact of climate change on human behavior and health was perhaps most clearly demonstrated during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014, but it also had clear implications for the cause of the COVID-19 pandemic. Earlier this year, Ireland published its International Climate Finance Roadmap, which sets out a plan for reaching, reaching the target set by our Taoiseach, our Prime Minister last year, to provide at least 225 million in climate finance per year by 2025. And the budget last week started the process of increasing our climate finance quite significantly. In the roadmap, we maintain a focus on climate change adaptation and resilience as a priority for our funding. This includes climate adaptation in key sectors such as health, nutrition, and food systems. Uh, and we are really keen to learn more about how health systems, services, and infrastructure can build resilience on the impacts of climate change while also positively contributing to climate action. It's a very, very rich and detailed area. And honestly, I don't think we could have anyone uh, more qualified or better than Dr. Maria Nera to uh, speak to us on it today. So uh, Dr. Nera, thank you again for joining us. I'm going to hand you the floor and look forward to a really good detailed discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director General, Ambassador, and thank you as well, the presenter. Uh, thanks for the pressure you're putting on me as well, saying that I am um, a person for, for providing the, the good uh, overview of this. I hope I will not disappoint you. Uh, let me, let me uh, first of all say that I love what you put it on your slogan on, on sharing ideas and shaping policy. This is most of the time what we are trying to do. I think that uh, today, uh, as you rightly say, we have a very strong evidence about what climate change is doing to our health. Of course, we, we still need more research. We still need to shape our interventions to make sure that we will put our money, our efforts, our energy, where we will have as much impact as possible. But we cannot say, we will never be able to say we didn't do uh, more on climate change because we didn't have enough evidence. We have very strong evidence, uh, many uh, uh, scientific papers demonstrating that climate change will have a negative impact on our health. And part of that negative, uh, the harmful impact in our health will come from the fact that uh, the causes of climate change are as well overlapping on a, on a big proportion with the causes of air pollution. And let me start with one of those uh, already negative, uh, terrible figures that we need to put on the, on, on the table at one point. The 7 million premature deaths. That's something which is absolutely unacceptable, but we are accepting it every day. We have every year 7 million premature deaths caused by exposure to air pollution means caused by the bad quality of the air we are breathing. And it's air that we must breathe. We cannot stop breathing. I mean, we have to breathe in Dublin. We have to breathe in Madrid. We have to breathe in, in, in Namibia. And we have to breathe in, in Mexico City. So this uh, actual uh, 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 totally unacceptable fact of the, 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 our air quality or lack of our air quality causing this damage to our health, I think is the first barrier that we need to analyze why is it still there, why we are not reacting at the level of ambition that the magnitude of, uh, magnitude of the problem represent. 
not only uh, we are causing 7 million deaths every year, air pollution, but air pollution is making sure that our hospitals are full, that our hospitals are treating diseases that um, are representing as well chronic diseases that are costing a lot to our health system. So the health system is already investing a lot on coping with the consequences of inaction on climate change and air pollution. So when, when someone at the international level on the, the different negotiation and conference, when we use this uh, argument that uh, it's very expensive, expensive to do mitigation of climate change, please make sure that you tell the economists of those who are uh, preparing that document that they need to include the cost that the health systems are already paying. And it's, believe me, very, very high. We have several studies as well demonstrating that the fact that we need to treat chronic diseases, diseases that will require long-term uh, hospitalization, and uh, uh, that represents not only, obviously, a terrible human suffering, but in addition to that, our health system is already responding and paying for the climate change. Not only our big and sophisticated hospitals, when, when you go to, to Africa or to uh, developing countries, you see that uh, those healthcare facilities, even in very isolated places, they are already somehow paying the price of climate change. Of course, they will be treating more diseases of um, the so-called climate sensitive diseases. They are having more cases of uh, dengue, or, or cases of mal more cases of malaria, because the, the, the global warming will facilitate certain diseases that are already occurring that are, will be exacerbated. So my first point that I wanted to, to share with you and to hopefully provoke a little bit for the discussion later on is no excuses. I mean, uh, we have the scientific evidence. As I say, we can always develop more. There is never enough on, on science, but we know that this is already occurring. There are uh, not only the, the, the disease burden, but as well a, a terrible cost for society and a terrible cost for our economies. So that element needs to be considered and not accepted as, a, as an excuse uh, when decisions are not taken. But let me now pass on something a little bit more positive. Let's, let's look at the opportunities we have here. You know, the, 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 the health professionals, the, the, the medical and, and health community for forever has been talking about prevention. And we have even prevention is better than cure. This is a, a fantastic sentence that even on your daily life you can incorporate. But unfortunately, we do not incorporate it on our daily life when we plan on this global health architecture. Because in fact, climate change adaptation on our own terminology, on the health professionals terminology, means secondary prevention. So we invented that already many years ago. And mitigation of climate change on our own terminology means primary prevention. So this is the positive part. Look at what will require to tackle the causes of climate change. It will require first, and most importantly, changing the sources of energy we are using at the moment. I mean, we need to accelerate this transition to a healthy, uh, renewable, clean source of energy. We can't afford, from a public health point of view, and now I'm exclusively talking about public health point of view, we can't afford to keep combusting fossil fuels. And we can't afford it, not, not because we are um, activists of the environment, we are eco-friendly people, we are leftist, uh, very Greenpeace uh, friends, or we are from a party that uh, has a very environmental uh, ecosystems agenda. We can't afford it because this is dramatically affecting our health. We need to stop composting fossil fuels because not only those fossil fuels are contributing to the climate change, the global warming, but they are contributing dramatically to this 
pollution of the air that we need and we need to breathe uh, the 10,000 approximately liters of, of, of air that we need every day. Imagine that air that we need every day coming into our lungs, damaging already our respiratory system. We know the diseases that can cause uh, from lung cancer to uh, asthma. I think asthma is one of the most visible linkages now between air pollution and uh, and um, health of the people because people connected very well the exposure to when the, the, the days are very polluted, the asthmatic people will feel it, that they will immediately feel at risk. So they connect very well. But as I say, the, the air, the polluted air we breathe, not only will stay in our lungs, in our respiratory system, it will go to the bloodstream. And from there, it can reach any of our organs, any. And now we are accumulating more and more evidence about the damage to our brain as well. So imagine that we are putting at risk our IQ, which is you know, the, the thing that will help us to survive as, as, a, as a society, as a humans. And uh, because we are breathing and we are exposed to pollutants that are very uh, damaging for our health. Let's go back to the positive. As I was saying, we have plenty of opportunities and we cannot miss any of them on our massive primary prevention uh, strategy. Everybody is these days after the pandemic and with the different crises we are facing in the middle of a horrible humanitarian situation, conflict and lack of biodiversity, everybody's talking about the crisis we are facing. Well, health professionals sometimes are very pragmatic. We used to be very pragmatic and we can easily make a diagnosis and then make some prescriptions. And our prescriptions would be the following. One, please accelerate the transition to clean, healthy, renewable sources of energy. That's fundamental for our health. And not only will benefit our health, it will decrease the cost for the health system, therefore benefiting as well economically. It will uh, contribute as well to a more sustainable economy. One dollar invested on a job for or generated by the fossil fuels uh, will generate uh, the, the renewable energy investment will generate four times more jobs than the, the, the dollar invested on the fossil fuels. So again, another argument of common sense that the, the, the health community can uh, put forward and, and hopefully promote those uh, fantastic opportunities. So first prescription, transition to healthy urban, uh, healthy uh, sources of energy. Second uh, prescription, accelerate a healthy urban planning. Our cities, today they are celebrating the International Architectural Day and they have decided that the theme will be designing for health. And it's very clear that uh, the way we design our cities will have a positive or negative influence on our health, depending, of course, what uh, decisions we are taking. And those decisions are fundamental because they will impact not only they will reduce air pollution if you have a healthy urban planning, you will reduce injuries and accidents, you will have buildings that are more and better and uh, for, for energy efficiency, you will be able to walk and therefore reduce your sedentary lifestyle and all the diseases that are associated with that. And if we are smart enough on the way we plan our cities, we will make sure that people will have access to, to healthy food and cheap food, and then we can reduce the obesity. Isn't it fantastic? Plus we will contribute to mental health and reducing inequities in cities. That's one of the most uh, fantastic challenges that we have in front of us. But again, we can use the funds to tackle the causes of climate change, to mitigate, mitigate climate change. And this might result on healthy urban, uh, healthy urban and therefore our health will, the, the health benefits, the health outcomes will be enormous. Next prescription about sustainable food systems. We need to change the way we, we produce food, we consume food, 
we manage the waste of the food we are generating. Uh, we are producing enough food for everyone, but unfortunately, one third of the food we produce is finishing into waste. We need to reshape as well of, of consuming. And again, that's something positive. It's something that we can use the health argument to further motivate that action on, 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 on climate change. So if you look at the agenda of climate change and you look at one by one to all the interventions and you take a manual of public health, you can confront the two and you will realize that they overlap. All of the interventions promoted under climate change mitigation and adaptation are public health pure and dure and basic interventions because we want to breathe uh, better air, we want to have clean water, we want to have uh, food. And now with the natural disasters we are, we are facing, with the destruction of the ecosystems that are breaking as well this barrier between human health and animal health, and therefore you know, destroying this concept of one health, which again is, is, is something so public health and so primary prevention approach that we need to retrieve it again. And as I say, the benefits for, for our population will be so good that we can use that to further motivate. And anytime you put in place an intervention, you can quantify the benefits for that. So this is the positive agenda and the prescriptions. Another prescription, please make sure you involve uh, mayors. Mayors are fundamental. In, in, in implementing our health agenda, because those are the ones that need to look at uh, the sustainable transport system for the citizens in the cities. They are the, they are the ones that can influence the, 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 the way the buildings are, are uh, organized and whether there is uh, efficiency or not in our use of energy. They will look at uh, whether we create some uh, climate uh, reviews in our cities, which looks that it will be very much needed. Uh, I was in London uh, this summer when the temperature reached 41 and it was clearly the big cities in Europe. We are not prepared to cope with the, the heat waves. Uh, and uh, well, I'm sure we need to start to think about that as well. Another prescription, and then um, uh, we, can, we can discuss, is how the health system can lead by a sample. And Director General mentioned it already that um, last year at COP26, one of the health commitments was, and I'm very happy about that, was on reducing on our own uh, carbon footprint. Obviously for, for, for middle and uh, high income uh, uh, countries, because low income countries, they are not only not generating any carbon footprint, they need to gain access to uh, um, the uh, electricity for, for, for uses as, as a healthcare facility. So leading by example, decarbonizing our own uh, health system. And um, this is very rewarding that the health professionals will are joining in with a, a lot of uh, enthusiasm. And I'm sure that the, the, the voices of those health professionals can help us to further motivate others and engage using the health argument for more climate action is something that we are very, very much promoting. Um, I think we have all of those um, opportunities. Uh, we need as well to use more the, 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 the positive language. Um, these days, people is terrified by, by the, the, the bad news that we are hearing all the time. And that generates sometimes a kind of paralysis or, or this apocalypse is now um, approach that we are using might generate uh, a paralysis by the population. Why, if we put it in positive, if you reduce your carbon footprint, if you take a bicycle instead of your car, if you take a bus instead of your private car, if you recycle, if you switch off the light, if you put pressure on your politicians, you can generate enormous health benefits. For me, the mantra here is influence, influence, influence. And I'm not talking about the influencers on social media. I'm talking about influencing ministers of energy, influencing ministers of economy, 
influencing ministers of environment, influencing mayors, influencing the, the big uh, responsibles for academic institutions, government institutions, citizens, all the associations we can put in place and then and create this very powerful network on a positive movement for um, using health argument for climate action. Another example mentioned it before, the support that um, has been given to the, the, the Global Fund to tackle malaria, TB, and, uh, and HIV AIDS. Well, if the Global Fund will put solar panels for their uh, refrigerators when they distribute their vaccines, for instance, what we are saying is that don't put a solar panel that will cover only the, 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 the needs of electricity for your refrigerator, the refrigerator of Gavi or the refrigerator of the Global Fund. Please upgrade the panels on an initiative that WHO is putting in place now, upgrade those panels and then you will have electricity for the whole healthcare facility. That's a way as well to be pragmatic, action oriented, uh, 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 jumping on opportunities, reducing the cost and still uh, obtaining a lot of health advantages. I think I will stop here. I can talk about this for, for ages, but definitely I hope to see you all at COP27, putting pressure where you can do it and making sure that the health argument will be very strongly positioned because it's the common sense one and it's the one that will generate finally more action and more ambition on this climate change agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Maria, thank you so much for that excellent input. Um, I think it's quite staggering that 7 million people per annum die as a result of air pollution. I think that figure alone should make us all sit up, pay attention and, and take greater action. Um, and I think also it's clear from your input that you know, health and bringing to light, making people more aware of the impact on our health everywhere across the world already of climate change is not just hugely damaging to us as individuals and to our societies, but is hugely costly. Um, so I think that's very important. Um, so please, by all means, everybody who is listening, um, please put your questions into the q and I'm going to come to a couple of questions now, uh, Dr. Neira. So maybe the first question I will ask you comes from Leanne Digny, who's a researcher at the IEA, IIEA. And the answer is that the UN General Assembly recently passed a resolution recognizing the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment as a human right. And the question is, what meaningful actions should member states, states take as a priority to ensure that this resolution will serve as a catalyst for systemic and transformative change? And if I could add to that, Dr. Neda, I wonder if you could, in your answer, comment on the different um, proportionate responsibility of governments such as the government of Ireland, governments in the European Union, and governments of low-income countries. So if the question is, what are the meaningful actions that member states should take as a priority, then, you know, if you could comment a little bit about, we've got very different resource environments in different parts of the world, I think it would be helpful for the audience to hear and understand your perspective on what those priority investments should be. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, let me start by this second part of your question about differentiate responsibilities. You know that one of the focus of the COP27 this year will be the so-called loss and damage. It was very interesting because last week I participated in one meeting where they were discussing about loss and damage. And of course they are looking at the loss of uh, land or the loss of uh, resources, the damage on the, on the ecosystems. And uh, which is already a huge agenda and whole countries need to commit to support those who have contributed the less to the climate change uh, uh, now to cope with the loss and damage. And uh, just to put yet another uh, strong piece there is that uh, obviously the loss and damage in terms of health is not considered. I mean, the agenda is already in terms of loss and damage so big that when I, ask it and are you considering health? They say, no, unfortunately, no, because there is not even yet a full commitment by countries on how to support. Um, as you know, Denmark has announced recently, I think it was Denmark, to, to, to um, 
a strong contribution to that in, 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 this, in discussing seriously about the different responsibilities. But I don't think we need to um, keep, uh, and in many countries uh, like uh, Fiji, who are you know, extremely vulnerable to climate change these days, uh, and their voices are always very strong. And they always say, we don't want to be victims only. We don't want just to be the ones receiving. We are raising our voice because what you are doing is, is nonsense, but we will put ourselves as well some solutions. And uh, so I think developing countries, of course, they need to um, start to move into renewable sources of energy. I think they need to learn from our mistakes. and. Uh, not only, uh, of course, they need to, to make sure that they help mobilize those resources that the, the, the rich countries, the developed countries need to share with them or, or put in place new technologies, but not committing the same mistakes, opening coal mining or, or opening. Now, you know, again, why we don't have solar panels in the whole continent in Africa, for instance, we need to invest on solutions where uh, the, 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 the countries, not only they receive support from something to, to, to repair something that they didn't do, but as well, they, they, they are equipped with the technology that will respond to the uh, challenges we have today. So differentiate responsibility. If you look at health, it's, it's, it's terrible because you see that the, the countries that are contributing the most are the countries that will be less affected in terms of health. And the countries that contribute in the less, like in Africa, there will be the countries most affected in terms of uh, health consequences as well. So it's, it's quite dramatic, but this will not exclude that the developing countries, they need to put in place uh, lessons learned and then not going to our path of development because it was wrong, our path of development. Um, now, in terms of the resolution on healthy environments, this is, um, you know, it's beautiful that finally this resolution was approved and recognized as a human right. At the same time, I think as a society, we need to ask ourselves, how can it be possible that we need a resolution to recognize that I have the, the, <laughs> the, the, the right to, to breathe clean air or, or have a clean water? But this is where we are. So this resolution was very important. And I know that the, the, the commission is now very much committed to, to move this agenda. We are joining forces and hopefully this will result on, on, on legislation as well. Why not? And, and taking countries to the court or, or, you know, this is happening as well. There are, there are groups that they are taking their own countries to court because uh, um, they, 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 do not, they are not taking actions to protect their, their own citizens. I think the case of Ella Tisidebra, I think is an, a very important one that will change legislation on this little girl who passed away with horrible asthma. But um, anytime she was cured at the hospital, she was sent back home where she was exposed to those horribly high levels of pollution in London. So I think more and more legislation will play a role as well. So it's not just a recognition of a human right, but using that resolution, hopefully action will come as well. And legislation might be one of those actions that we will put in place. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Neira. And it's shocking to hear that story of that little girl who ultimately tragically lost her life as a result of air pollution. Um, and I think you're absolutely correct that legislative measures are increasingly being used by citizens who are concerned that their governments are not taking climate change sufficiently seriously. Um, I'm going to come to a question from Kirsten Hadfield, and Kirsten is an assistant professor in global health at Trinity College Dublin. And Kirsten says that here in Ireland, there's a lot of reticence from the public and from the government to reducing road space for cars and for reallocating it to pedestrians and cyclists and public transport. Um, and it is true that even minor changes to our transport systems are fought very hard. Um, so we feel we're very behind, therefore, in reducing our transit emissions and other emissions. And Kirsten's question is, do you have any suggestions for how we as citizens can try to push these changes forward with the goal of promoting health and reducing climate impacts? Thank you. Thank you. And Christian, I fully agree with you. There are a lot of re reluctance, unfortunately, in many places, even the citizens. 
Sometimes they have reluctant to have a solar panels. Sometimes they are reluctant to have a wind, uh, you know, turbines. Uh, sometimes they are reluctant to, to reduce uh, 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 road space. And sometimes they are reluctant to stop smoking. Um, what do we, or even to use the, 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 you know, the safety belt for, for road safety purposes. But I think it's up to us, public health authorities and governments to have a look at the, 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 the public health. I mean, the public health means looking at the collectivity and, and, and protecting the rights of individuals, but at the same time, looking at uh, uh, how public health can be the, 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 the outcome of this type of intervention. Um, what we know is that um, we have created what we call the Breathe Life campaign. We are doing this with um, UNEP and the Climate and Cleaner Coalition and, and other organizations now. And the idea is exactly that, is, is create a platform where experiences about uh, um, changing cities and putting in place some interventions like uh, promoting a, a very efficient uh, sustainable transport system, um, collecting all of those samples and experiences, how can this be useful to, for other cities? And uh, I will, Christian, invite you to have a look at this brief life um, catalog and initiatives because this is the way where mayors are exchanging um, experiences and ideas, and of course, frustrations as well. Uh, in some cases, in some cities in France, for instance, the mayors have a lot of opposition by the citizens because they say, well, if you reduce road um, uh, space, you will then um, reduce maybe the, the, the shops will reduce their uh, income and they will not be uh, of interest of citizens. So I think we need to obviously uh, be uh, very um, good on the narrative, on explaining to citizens what will be the advantages uh, from he for health, for, for economic purposes, and as well using the samples of other cities where at the beginning the citizens were very much opposed, but then now they don't want to go back. And this is a, an experience that we have everywhere. Even if at the beginning it was a big opposition and the mayor insisted and then they went ahead, um, at the beginning, it was resistance, but then the citizens never wanted to go back. When you think that even in Rome, the Coliseum, you know, around the Coliseum, it was until a few years ago, um, you know, a, a place where cars could go. It was such a dense traffic there. The Coliseum, imagine our patrimoine. Uh, so yes, we need to, to move. So. Tell your citizens to look at other experiences, have a good argument about how health will be beneficial, and be conscious as well that sometimes that the economic arguments needs to be considered as well and explained properly to the citizens because they cannot buy only the, the, the environmental or health arguments if they think that there will be suffering on their economies because that's you know the daily maybe urgency for many of them is that. Uh, just an, a, a last example, in Mexico City, uh, a city which is very, very polluted, the mayor decided to reduce pollution and using the health argument, so we were very much behind. But unfortunately, the decision that was taken was to uh, ban all the cars that were more than, I don't know, five or six years old. You know, if you don't have a good solution uh, in terms of sustainable transport, what you are doing is you are penalizing the, 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 the vulnerable part of your population because the, the, the rich people will never have a car which is all. I mean, it's, it's the modest people, the people with low economy, the ones that will have very old car, very old polluted car. So you need to have a look as well at maybe subsidies, maybe a good uh, sustainable transport. You need to have a holistic approach to all of those measures. You cannot have it in, in vertical because maybe you fix something and you create an, uh, in, an inequity or, or a problem somewhere else. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. And I think you're right. I think we can all recognize even from our own experience here in Ireland how people might resist a positive behavior of change, but once it's embedded, then not only welcome it, but sometimes um, congratulate ourselves loudly for having been one of the first to introduce it, such as the plastic bag tax and the city bikes, of course, which are now hugely popular here. Um, but maybe if I just go to um, another issue, which is which comes in from Leanne Digney again, researcher at the IIEA, um, and this is sometimes used in discourse, you know, when we're talking about changing behaviour, and there's a sort of a what about response. So Leanne's question is around um, the impact of countries such as China and India. Um, so of course, air pollution is a huge problem of public health, particularly for lower income countries. And countries such as China and India, and we could probably add a few more, are currently economically dependent on pollution heavy manufacturing industries. Um, and these governments therefore have few incentives to abate air pollution. The question is what can the international community do to address this? But if I could also add in a secondary question, which is how can we short circuit the argument that you know, China and India are much bigger problems and therefore we don't need to change, they do. That, that's the question because uh, I think at, at the COPs, uh, this is an argument that has been used very often, unfortunately, the fact that, well, you know, those are the most polluters. If you add the uh, US and uh, China and India, the rest of us, we can uh, relax because we are small contributors. Well. Again, we need to look at the individual. So independently where you are, you need to look at uh, how this is affecting my lungs, my, my health. And then if we use that, there is not, never enough level of ambition to go for more, uh, keeping in mind that we need to protect the economy, but this is feasible. Look at the, the Scandinavians. The Scandinavians are, are um, among the most uh, environmentally friendly for their own people, maybe. <laughs> Uh, but for their own people, and they are a very important economy. So it's feasible. Now, India and China is very interesting because definitely India is um, unfortunately one of the countries where um, the, the, the respect for WHO air quality guidelines is, is you know, unfortunately uh, going beyond our standards on, uh, many, many times. And uh, the reasons for that pollution are many. But ironically, um, at the end of Glasgow COP26, um, India refused on accepting some of the, the, the agreements that the, 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 the COP26 uh, wanted to take. And um, the day after the COP, um, business was closed in New Delhi, the schools were closed, um, all the outside construction and buildings were closed because the levels of pollution were such that it was impossible to see. So it was uh, impossible to work outside and impossible to take children to school. And that has an economic cost. And what has an economic cost in China is that they realized that international um, organizations or, or, or industries or big multinationals um, they don't want to live there. I mean, they, they are concerned about the health of their families and it's becoming a very um, challenging duty station for, for many professionals. And they realize that uh, there are many things related to that pollution that is bad for their economy as well. So interestingly, in China, although there are still among the, the biggest polluters, no doubt, but the, the trend is starting to get stable or probably going down. So they realize that this is not good for business at all. So they are taking some measures and uh, we hope that now that the energy crisis will not uh, revert to those measures, but uh, the trend is going there. In India, um, it's, it's more challenging because the, 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 the sources of pollution are uh, many. And uh, they might take in some states, I mean, the, the, the structure of the whole country as well, the, the, the bureaucracy might create uh, some difficulties. But definitely, this is something that um, sooner or later, India will wake up. So this association of if you want to develop, you, not, you need to pollute is, is, is a nonsense because 
you can learn from those who polluted to be developed and then avoid the, the, the wrong decisions and use the new technology and those resources that will be allocated for intelligent and, and healthy solutions instead of repeating the same mistakes on a very polluting development that will give you then a level of, of, of business very low. Because if your rivers are polluted in India or in, in, in China, um, you know, the, you might make some business in a few months, but in a few years, you will be out of business. Thanks very much, Dr. Nair. I think that's that's really interesting and also encouraging. Um, and it's very stark when you say that um, by direct comparison with the, re the reluctance of a government maybe to give concessions around climate emissions, then if you have direct evidence that actually their economy as well as their people are suffering as a result of poor air quality, um, maybe that might force a change. Um, there's a question here again in the whole area of innovative solutions and thinking outside the box. Colin O'Hare has a question. He was inspired by your example of the solar panels, not just for vaccine installations, but for the wider health system. And he says that the possibilities of thinking outside the box could be far reaching. So Ireland, for example, is supporting a health perspective in work by the EU on building design. And his question is, are there any other examples where health or climate considerations need to feature in broader actions? Well, interesting question. Uh, definitely we are thinking and every day to make sure that we are not missing any of those. But when you look at the emergency operations, okay, and you look at the humanitarian um, community, which is huge uh, at large, I mean, any, or every government will have a humanitarian branch and an international support for emergency situations. We are still sending diesel or to our emergency operations to operate the, the, the diesel generators in many healthcare facilities. Mm -hmm. So this is already a, a kind of shocking or until very recently in our emergency operations, we were still sending um, for, for construction purposes asbestos um, for pipes and things like that. Uh, but let's, let's focus on the opportunities. Yes, I see one which is this on, on not sending diesel for diesel generators at the, the healthcare facilities. Please, it's extremely costly to transport. Second is clearly not environmentally friendly. And third, we have a much better solution, which is having solar panel at that facility. And, and uh, electrifying now uh, healthcare facilities with solar panels is one of our key projects. And we want to, to put an effort on that and create some coherence and common sense approach all of this uh, network of institutions that are now with the best of the intentions, sending one refrigerator with one solar panel, because the purpose is to keep my vaccine for which I have the responsibility. That cannot be. The other one, uh, in terms of opportunities, and is, this is huge as well, is that any uh, international organization that is building healthcare facilities, and there are many that they, they build the healthcare facilities or hospitals, please, don't call it healthcare facility if you don't provide uh, sanitation and water and electricity services. Call it something else. Call it a, you know, a building or call it a piece of brick, uh, as you wish. But I mean, it's the minimum. If you open something which is called healthcare facility, please make sure as a basic, basic recommendation and again, an opportunity that the provision for hygiene, sanitation, and come on, electricity are there. And at least the water and sanitation, I don't even, I mean, it would be a dream to have electricity, but come on. I mean, we are in, in the, in the, on a pandemic where the main recommendation was wash your hands. For almost half of the, the population around the world, washing your hands is, is, is a challenge. You don't have soap in the healthcare facilities in Africa. You don't have water. And, and how do you want to provide? So please, when you build facilities, 
basic standards. You can reduce maybe the size, but make sure that there is water and sanitation otherwise. Don't call it healthcare facility. Thank you, Dr. Neira. And I know from your own work that there's a shocking number and percentage of healthcare facilities globally that don't meet those global standards. I think if I'm right, it's about 50% of healthcare facilities don't have either um, hand washing facilities in the bathrooms or adequate sanitation stations within the hospital operating infrastructure itself. So I think um, if we're asking you what the priorities are, they're becoming very clear. Um, and this, this may well be our last question, but we do have a question here around oh sorry i've got a question here around biomass fuels and i've got one other question on priority so maybe we'll just take these two so question from emily binchy at the iiea who says that today the investing in health for all high level event organized by the who and the european investment bank is taking place what outcomes do you hope to see from that event and then the second question and i leave you with both of these is from Keelan O'Sullivan at the IIEA also, who says that approximately 2.4 billion people depend on biomass fuels as their main source of energy for cooking. So what practical changes can be made to move away from burning biomass fuels in low-income countries? Fascinating questions. Thank you very much. Uh, regarding the investment case, very simple. If you look at the... the um, my dream eh? doesn't mean that it's discussed at the moment on the investment case, but my dream will be 25% of the global burden of diseases is linked to modifiable environmental risk factors. So one quarter of the whole mortality and morbidity globally is linked to environmental risk factors that you can modify. As we were saying, access to safe water, sanitation, occupational health standards, uh, chemicals that we use, climate change and air pollution. So this is the 25%. It can be reduced every year very easily. So those factors can be modifiable. Uh, it's not something that is happening and there is nothing you can do about it. No, you can modify it. So when you look at the investment that we are doing on health, 97% of the resources are going for care and 3% is going to prevention. So please, that will be my, my call and my dream about this investment. Increase a little bit, I'm not saying to 25%, which will be kind of balanced, because I don't want to reduce investment on care, but maybe if we increase the, the investment on prevention, that investment might come as well from the Ministry of Energy or the Ministry of Environment or the Ministry of Economy, or the Minister of uh, Urban Planning, because all of those interventions are the ones that will help us with this agenda. But at least uh, please increase the, the, the investment on environmental health, because now we are less than 1%, and this is, I, if you allow me to say, ridiculous. Um, regarding the, the, the biomass fuels, again, another thing that is absolutely uh, unacceptable, almost half of the world population is cooking like like in the Stone Age. So not in, like in the last century, no. The Stone Age, I mean, you do an open fire and you put inside whatever you can find, uh, you know, uh, vegetal coal or, or, or wood or uh, um, whatever is around. And then you put girls to do that for hours. And then they need to first collect it, then they need to cook, and then they need to inhale it. The, the moms, the girls, and the babies in the back of those moms. So if somebody thinks that this is a good society, if somebody thinks that this is a good investment, it's not. But in addition to that, from a health point of view, this is almost criminal. So we need to accelerate access to clean household fuels for heating, lightening, and, uh, and uh, cooking. And this is an agenda very, very much neglected, but uh, we are doing our best accelerating that. And we have created a high level panel of, for action, uh, convening ministers of health and ministers of energy. And on the 7th of October, so this week, we are having the second meeting of those energy ministers and health ministers, looking at whether we can accelerate and convince ministers of energy of the importance of discussing with ministers of health on healthcare facilities, access to, to, to electricity, 
and uh, household um, clean fuels for household level, at household level. Excellent. Thank you very much. And, you know, I'm acutely aware working in this sector that indoor air pollution is, is um, a huge driver of illness and ill health in, in many of the countries that we work in. So, so thank you for that. And I think you're absolutely right to link it also to gender inequality and the fact that it's women and girls that are leaning over the fire, breathing in the particulate matter with sometimes a baby or small children in the environment as well. And that can do huge damage in the long term. Um, Dr. Nera, we're drawing very close to the end of this session. Is there any final message that you would like to give to your audience this afternoon? Uh, just to say that thank you very much for, 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 for the opportunity, the privilege, and of course, please keep with passion, interest, don't give up. We can change this, and uh, I think the health will be probably one of the big motivation to accelerate this agenda, so use health as a, a strong motivation. Thank you, Dr. Nair. I think that's an excellent message, and especially as we approach COP27, it gives a bit of a freshness maybe to some of the discourse. So I'd like to thank you very, very warmly for giving your time to us this afternoon, for giving us such a positive outlook as well um, on what are all of the solutions, that in fact the solutions are very much in our hands, and it is a matter of us taking action and doing that with a greater degree of urgency than we have done heretofore. So thank you very much for your excellent input. Thank you also to Michael Gaffey, Director of Irish, Director General of Irish Aid. Thank you to the IIEA team and to all of the participants who are here present today. Um, I'm sure we all look forward to being together again in the near future for another a lecture and discussion as part of this Development Matters series. Thank you very much, Dr. Nera. Thank you very much. And goodbye you. to all. Thank you. Pleasure.